I broke it on the channel and I even had it stabilized because they were trying to debunk it so bad and they just couldn't do it. Wright Patterson, by the way, is the Air Force base where they took the wreckage of the Roswell alien crash in 1947. And so Fox News and other uh, media outlets featured this footage three or four years ago, but now it's almost like, well, we're getting too close to the truth, so we're just going to feature vague UFO footage. But again, I just wanted to show you guys this, show you what's really out there, show you what Jeremy Corbell and Elizondo or any other of the big talking UFO heads are afraid to post or simply don't have the sources like I do. But tell me what you think. Wright Patterson is the new Area 51, along with many other bases that we don't know about. So.
let's see here. I won't show that. Here's Now listen to Lou Elizondo. Remember, he's the one who ran ATIP, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. And Elizondo quit his position as head of ATIP. But Lou Elizondo was approached by one of his superiors. And listen to what he said. When you mentioned something, confl UFOs conflicting with uh, those with some within the Pentagon, philosophically or religiously, um, were they because of that? Uh, did you? Was there any proactive suppressing or limiting of how much you could do because of that? Sure. I, I had to be very careful. I really had to operate in the shadows more than ever. Uh, I was used to doing it because of my, 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 my job. But, you know, I wasn't used to running operations, you know, inside my own organization. Uh, but that's what we had to wind up doing because there were people that were, were certainly uh, against this, this effort. Uh, and, and only because of, again, their, their philosophical belief system. I had nothing to do. In Listen. fact, I, I had one, I remember the conversation very well. Um, this is a person I respected tremendously, very, very senior person. He told me, he said, Lou, I want you to stop, stop doing this. Listen. I said, okay, sir, I, I certainly can, but may I ask why? And he says, well, we already know what it is. Now, at that moment, I, I honestly thought maybe it was our own technology. I was running up against some super uber secret sap, and, uh, you know, they were telling me to stop. And I said, okay, sir, so so it's ours? And he said, no, that's not what I'm saying. And he said, uh, he asked me point blank, have you read your Bible lately? And I wasn't quite sure where he was going with that. And I said, well, sir, I, 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 I think I know what it says. What, where are you going with this? And he said, well, then you would know that these things are, are demonic and we should not be pursuing them. Yeah. And uh, I, I, he, was, he wasn't kidding. He was, that's exactly how, how he felt. Anyway, that's where it stops. Can you get this now? He's told by one of his superiors, somebody who has a lot of authority at the Pentagon telling Lou Elizondo, stop doing what you're doing. Why, sir? We already know what they are. What are they? Have you read your Bible? Yes, but what are you getting at? He said, they're demonic. They are. That is exactly what they are. Um, this right here is one of my, be, without a doubt, one of my favorite videos. One of the one of the families that follow our ministry. He is a commercial airline pilot. The guy's got years of experience. Great guy. Loves the Lord. Loves the King James Bible. I asked him, I said, have you ever seen one? He said, no, but he says he knows somebody. He's the one that put me onto this video. This is the Aguadilla Airport in Puerto Rico. This airport is part of the Department of Homeland Security. We have an unidentified flying object. This obviously is is infrared video uh, you can see how it keeps changing shapes and all this stuff it's weird but it's over not just over United States airspace it's flying over the Department of Homeland Security airspace this will get you shot down if you tried to do this they have a helicopter f tracking this thing following it in a minute, you're going to see it go under the water without making a splash, come out of the water without making a wave, split into two, disappear in the water. Then they can't find it anymore. Watch this. Again, this is from, this was leaked. 
Department of Homeland Security helicopter tracking an unidentified flying object over the Aguadilla Airport in Puerto Rico. It goes under the water. Now it comes back up, making no waves whatsoever under the water again. You can see it under the water. Back up. Under the water. Back up again. Under the water. Back up again. Now it's going to split in two. Look at that. Two different objects now. Absolutely insane. Go under the water and disappear. Now, again, a lot of you are familiar with the, the two powers stuff uh, that I do and talk about, especially, again, if you've read the book. But for those who are not, of course, you have the Shema, very familiar uh, creedal statement from Judaism, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. <clears throat> this is, I, I bring this up because how could a Jew affirm that and then write this? No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side. Okay. How do you pull that off? He has made him known. Now, you know, John is a Jew. He knows the Shema. What in the world is going on here? Uh, at one time in, in Judaism, Judaism used to affirm something that they used to uh, talk about positively as the two powers in heaven idea. This is not dualism, one good guy, one bad guy, of equal weight. Okay, it's not uh, you know, Marvel Comics or anything like that. These were two good guys, okay, two powers in heaven. And that idea falls into ill repute, disrepute, at around the second century. Again, not coincidentally the time you know when we have the advent of Christianity and a few other things going on. But Judaism, at one point in its history, essentially had a Godhead teaching. And they get it from their Old Testament. So when you have a, a Jew like John who writes this, of course, knowing the Shema, he, he's not thinking when he's writing this, oh, <clears throat> this is good. I get to deny my faith in the God of Israel now. Okay. He's not thinking that at all. So... He's sort of the exemplar for just the average question, even for Jewish converts in the book of Acts or whatever. You know, how is it that, that these people, Jews, who refused even on pain of death to worship another god, how could they at the same time turn around and embrace Jesus as God in the flesh? Worship him, sing praises to him, again, talk about him the way they do. How, how could they do that? and not feel like they were violating the formative creedal statement of the Old Testament. How does that work? And it, it's a big deal. I mean, it's still a big deal for, for Jews I've met. Um, again, we're going to go through this real quickly, but there's, there's a whole rabbinic discussion about the two powers prior to the second century. And just an example of one verse, the, the, the rabbis would, would pick up on on different verses that they knew looking at it was a little bit odd. There was something odd in them. Genesis 19:24. this is the Sodom and Gomorrah story, which I'm sure all of you have read. But you look at this and what's odd about it? You tell me. Yeah, it sounds like there's two Yahwehs. You know, Yahweh raining fire upon Sodom and Gomorrah, or, you know, sulfurous fire. And, and that sulfur, sulfurous fire happens to be from Yahweh. So how can Yahweh 
you know, send this sulfurous fire from Yahweh. Just, it, it, just, it was just odd. And, you know, rabbis would, would notice these things and discuss them. Again, the major book on this, if you're interested, is still in print. It was printed in 1977, The Two Powers in Heaven, by Alan Siegel. Siegel uh, passed away a few years ago. He was a Jew, Jewish scholar, rabbinic scholar, and his book is about the history of this idea in Judaism. He goes through all the rabbinic material, uh, again, establishing the fact that, yep, we used to teach this. <laughs> And boy, it's a it's heretical, isn't it? You know, I mean, because he he was a Jew. He he doesn't want to go along with it. But his book is just about yeah, this used to be part of our theology. Get until the second century A.D. Other passages: Daniel. Again, you have the Ancient of Days seated, and then you have you know the description, which is you know all familiar to us: hair like lamb's wool thrown in tongues of flame, just like Ezekiel 1. I mean, we know who this is, the wheels, the whole bit. And then the court sat, again, divine council meeting, the books were open, one like a human being, you know, one like a son of man, a human one, came with the clouds of heaven, dominion, glory, and kingship were given to him. There's something else about this passage that I don't have in red. I don't even know if you can see the color there. <clears throat> this whole motif of the coming upon the clouds which I'm not going to get into specifically here. I'll get into some other two power stuff, but I'll mention this this much. In the ancient Near Eastern world, the epithet, the one who comes with the clouds or the one who comes upon the clouds or the one who rides the chariot in the clouds, something like that, that was a known epithet for Baal. Okay, Baal is not an underling. He's not just an angel. Okay, I'm saying this for like Jehovah's Witnesses because Jehovah's Witnesses like to take deity language used of Jesus and say, oh, he's just an angel and a created being and all this kind of stuff. Well, the coming on the upon, uh, upon the clouds thing is a big deal because of the way it gets used in the New Testament when Jesus is on trial because it goes back to Daniel 7. But anyway, you, you get this well-known deity phrase. The Old Testament writers use this deity phrase that everybody, Jew or outside of Judaism, you know, whether you're Israelite or not, they know what, what this is because Baal was such a big deal in the ancient world. Baal was worshipped even in the Roman period. Okay, he's, he's, he's just a big figure. And the biblical writers in the Old Testament use the phrase four times of Yahweh of Israel. And the reason was Baal was a, was a storm god. He's, he was the god that was perceived as giving us rain, you know, Baal's a wonderful guy because he gives us rain. And that means our crops grow. That means we get to eat. You know, it means our, our animals get to eat. We're alive because Baal sends us rain and we can survive. And always oh, wonderful. Right? Well, the biblical writers are like, no, 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 no. Baal isn't the one who controls this stuff. It's Yahweh of Israel. So they would take this label and stick it on Yahweh, you know, to, to make this theological point. Well, the only place they don't do that, there's one other occurrence and it's Daniel 7. Here it's applied to a second figure, aside from the God of Israel. And so Jesus knows this. I mean, he, the Jews knew it. This was one of, their, one of the, the, the primary texts in Judaism for, to reinforce this, the two powers in heaven teaching was this one right here, Daniel 7. So when Jesus is on trial in front of Caiaphas, and Caiaphas says, come on, tell us who you are. You know, quit beating around the bush. And he says, okay. Okay, now listen up, Caiaphas. You know, I don't want you to miss this. So hereafter, you will see the Son of Man coming upon the clouds, you know, in great glory. Okay, that, you want to know who I am? I'm the guy in Daniel 7 who's the cloud rider. And Caiaphas tears his clothes, says this is blasphemy. He knows instantly what Jesus is saying. And every Jew would have. Because they have this two powers thing. There's, there's Yahweh... But then there's like this other guy. Additional note, it is interesting to note that in the Gilgamesh epic, tab at 11, a snake steals the immortality of humanity, line 283. After which Gilgamesh laments that the... This is a, is a really weird phrase in Gilgamesh. 
Gilgamesh laments that the earth lion in Akkadian Nashu Shah Kakari had stolen his chance at eternal life. What in the world is going on here? Why? The story has a snake. It's Bitsuru here. And when Gilgamesh is sitting down feeling sorry for himself, he refers to this thing as an, an earth lion. Well, what the heck is that? Earth lion is the same way that Greek expresses the word for chameleon. Kamai leon. Kamai is on the ground, on the earth. Leon, lion, earth, lion. That's what chameleon literally means. Noted cuneiform scholar Ake Joburg has suggested, and it's just a suggestion, but I think it's worth thinking about, it may be possible to connect the Akkadian Neshu with the Eblaite Naish, and that word with the Hebrew Nakash. Now, why do I bring this up? Because Neshu, 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 okay, Nakash. And what that leads to is the significance of this possible connection is that one would have a serpentine being in an Eden like story who was a changeling. Chameleons change their appearance, don't they? This might resonate with 1st Enoch 19.1, where the watchers were said to be able to change form, and perhaps 2nd Corinthians 11.14, this is the verse where it talks about Satan being able to tran be transformed into an angel of light. Uh, he can appear uh, as something brilliant and wonderful when he actually is not. The identity, we talked about this, that was our first point, identity, nature, and fate of the serpent. Let's talk about serpentine beings elsewhere besides the one we, we think of, the Nakash in the garden. Some tentative comments and speculations. And again, I'm, I'm deliberately saying this because, I, quite frankly, I'm still thinking about some of this. I don't know quite what to make of it. Trust me, folks, this is, you know, pardon the expression, virgin territory. It's not like I can go look up a commentary or go ask some scholar to think in these terms. It's not going to happen. And so, you know, I, I'm still cogitating on, on a good bit of this. The reference to the shining being in the Garden of Ezekiel as a shining anointed cherub is interesting, but rarely received, it's rarely received much thought since scholars assume that cherubim and seraphim are different. Many scholars assume that seraphim means burning ones from Hebrew saraph. The cherubim are sphinx-like creatures based on ancient Near Eastern divine throne iconography. Now, if you were here with the Ezekiel session, you know that there's a lot of cherubim that look like sphinx-type creatures. Yeah, that, that's, that's true. Now, the question is, is that all they are? Is that only what they are in the Semitic mind? Now, I think all the assumptions are open to question, and some observations might come come to fruition here, or at least contribute. The relationship of cherubim and seraphim is uncertain. If one removes the four-faced cherubim from the category, and you know my view now that I don't think the point is literal cherubim, I think the point is the four faces of the zodiac. So if you, if you accept that and accept E-X-C-E-P-T, the two-faced cherubim of Ezekiel, which again, if Flynn is correct, that's also precessional. If you exclude the processional stuff, then cherubim normally described elsewhere are simply winged creatures. On occasion, the description of a cherub includes features that are not in the iconography of the ancient world, such as the hands of a man, but which are shared with seraphim. Here I'm suggesting maybe there's a relationship between cherubim and seraphim. Again, it's possible, I'm still thinking about it. The function of both could be called guardianship of the council or the throne of God. Seraphim, of course, are the ones that guard the throne in Isaiah 6. Genesis 3.24, after Adam uh, is driven out of the garden, God places a flaming uh, a seraph, a seraphim, uh, there at the, at the entrance to the garden. And then, of course, Ezekiel 28, uh, taking Meshach, again, as shining. Uh, you might have one there, too. So seraphim are quite likely serpentine. The, ser the term seraph is interchanged with nakash, same word, serpent in the garden, the shining one, in the account of Moses and the serpents that bite is the Israelites in Numbers 21. But what I'm going, just going through is what we, what we do know here. In, in this story, in Numbers 21, the children of Israel are going through the desert and they, and to, to punish them. 
uh, again, for, for grumbling and murmuring after they've been delivered by the, at the Red Sea and a, and a few other kind of amazing deliverances, God says, you know, the, the people are grumbling again, despite the fact that I've done these amazing things for them. And he sends serpents to that, that bite the Israelites. The serpents in that account are called both. They go by both terms. They're called Nakash and Saraf. These are synonyms. Okay, we know what this is. A serp- it can mean a serpentine thing. But most scholars say that this just means burning one. Well, guess what? While there is a root saraf to me that means to burn in Hebrew, it is equally true that there is saraf right here in Numbers 21. That's just a serpent. So what I'm suggesting here is that a seraphim might be a serpentine being. That might be what they look like. Okay, again, I'm still thinking about this. Uh, in Egypt, seraph, uh, Egypt actually combines the features. Uh, a seraph in Egypt is a, f- is a shining or flaming serpent. So they, they sort of dovetail both possibilities in Egyptian literature and Egyptian iconography. What happens when the that river dries up? I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So these are demon spirits of some kind. For they are the spirits of devils or demons working miracles which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So this is the draw. There are supernatural agencies that are bringing this about. Interestingly enough, they're being drawn, being drawn by, uh, they're coming out of Satan, the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, that's his, the great world, you know, the world leader, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So these are demon spirits that are coming out of these, this so-called satanic trinity. And they are the spirits of devils working miracles. Oh, I was, one thing I find fascinating, um, when Dr. Mark Eastman and I uh, did a research project uh, which resulted in a book on UFOs and, and alien abductions and all of that called Alien Encounters, uh, obviously as we did that research, you quickly discover that these reports are, 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 are too bizarre to accept and yet too consistent to ignore that uh, of these uh, uh, alien beings, they're always in th- one of three kinds. You have the little th- men, three foot high, diminutive creatures. You have the plebeians, as they sometimes call them, or the, the, uh, 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 they're, they're typically six foot high, blonde hair, blue eyes, that look like people. And then you've got the third group, which are the power ones apparently, that are called the reptilians. The, the, the grotesque descriptions that you think came out of a grade B science fiction movie or something. But you always find that th- th- there's a well-established structure, in the literature at least, of these three different kinds. But the, the fact that uh, some of the most um, extreme um, episodes are associated with these so-called reptilians fascinated me because they look like they're, they're grotesque kinds of frogs. And I couldn't, uh, couldn't resist the, the, the linkage between the, the frogs in the scripture here, the unclean spirits like frog. Because in both cases you're talking about demons. Clearly what's going on in the UFO area is demonic and that's a whole other area. But uh, these, are demo- these are obviously demonic. They are the spirits of devils working miracles. See we're not ready to, we, we, we can't imagine these evil things doing miracles. Why? Because the restrainer is restraining them. The restrainer is removed when the rapture happens. It's, uh, uh, I, I think uh, there's, there's a, he's restraining a lot more than, than we have any idea. But these spirits of the devils are going to go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to do what? To gather them together to a geographic battle that we're going to deal with here in a couple verses. So now we, we've, so now we have a strange little episode here. Behold, I come as a thief. You, do you notice the change of subject? We have this dark stuff going on. It's going to continue. But there's this little verse tucked in here as sort of a catch your breath kind of thing. Sort of a pause. Change of subject. 
Behold, who comes as a thief? Jesus comes as a thief. Now, um, that's not addressed to us. Remember, Paul wrote to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 4, you are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. It's, he comes as a thief to those who are in darkness. Read 1 Thessalonians 5, that whole chapter. It's clear, Paul makes two groups. The children of the day, children of the night. Keep in mind we're dealing with deception. Scripture told us to be aware of an end time delusion. Delusion meaning deception, delusion. Okay? Whatever it takes to make you believe that these entities are going to use. Are there physical aspects of this experience? Yes, there are. Not just the abduction experience, but the UFO experience too. They can manifest this word manifest. If you understand what scripture says, it says these, these angels, which we believe they are fallen angels, as God's angels, they also have the ability to manifest from the other realm, which Christians, we would call that the spiritual realm, into the physical realm. There is many documented stories of that, angels doing that in scripture. They actually could not be able to tell the difference between them and other humans, they were that close to perfection in their manifestation. Can they manifest a ship that buzzes through the air that gets tracked on radar? Yes. Can they manifest physical marks on your body? Can they manifest into the physical long enough to do things like that?